Okay. I'd like to thank you all for joining us here. Um, so this is the first of hopefully many uh, Bridge SMS seminar series, so a project, uh, FB7 funded project uh, between the UCC, the universities I've read, uh, Cork County Council, NIBUS, and the infrastructure in Portugal. Um, I'm honoured to introduce uh, Dr. Sergio Maldonado Venezuela, um, who was, has recently completed a PhD in Edinburgh and is now a postdoc in Stanford University. He was also in UCC for two years uh, previously during his time as a PhD student. And uh, he, uh, his interests are in fluid dynamics and in coastal protection. So I'd like to welcome Sergio and hand it over to him. Thanks, Paul, and uh, thank you for organizing this presentation. I think it turned out to be more formal than what I expected, even with online streaming and all that, which is slightly intimidating. But um, so, I went, while, while talking to Paul, I wasn't sure what focus to give to this presentation because I know that people here have very wide interests. So I've tried to keep it that way, a bit general. And in the general topic that I want to speak about is the idea of the nature-based solutions for coastal protections and some challenges, some potential solutions. So while speaking about that, that will take me a little bit uh, to show you some of the work I've done, some of the work I'm, uh, I'm currently doing, and some of the work that I plan to do. So it's very general, um, so I've tried to put it in a coherent way that hopefully will make sense and you will find interesting. So I was expecting an informal presentation, so feel free to interrupt me if, if you wish. Hmm. So, well, to start with, with what, what is this whole thing of nation-based coastal protection? So in the context of climate change, we hear more about this, and even though it has been recognized for a long time that, say, mangroves or marshes can reduce the impact that the storms have, uh, now we're starting to explore that idea because it turns out that conventional solution might not necessarily be the best all the time. So sea walls, for example, after all, do not grow when sea level rises, and uh, marshes and mangroves, uh, on their hand, may adapt to, to a sea level rise, for example, and as I mentioned, they can also minimize the impact of a, of a storm or flooding. So now, the, how we typically do beach nourishment is by just basically dumping sand whenever that the storm or the sea takes it away, but that might not be the most cost-benefit, uh, that might be the most uh, economic way of doing it. On the other hand, we can do what the Dutch are starting to explore, which is the idea of the sand engine, where they do a single massive nourishment, but they take the time to analyze the, the site and study the dynamics of the site in such a way that they benefit from the sea, who, by action of the currents and the waves, diffuses out that hump that we see there and provides the adjacent beaches with a, with a known and predictable source of sand. So we know worth working with nature instead of against nature. So these are ideas that, that are starting to be explored, but I think we are still very, on, there's so much uncertainty about this, some of the challenges. Uh, the two ends, the way I see it, at the fundamental and at the, and at the applied end. So the fundamental, we fundamentally ignore how, for example, vegetation interacts with the hydrodynamics. And at the, other, at the other end, at the applied end, we need the uh, people with money, the policy makers, the stakeholders to, move, to, to invest on this fundamental research. So how, do we, how can we tackle that problem? So that's something that I want to talk about. And that's, in a nutshell, what I'm currently doing during my postdoc at Stanford. Is trying to work in these two two sides. So, on one side, I work at the Department of Geophysics. I will speak a bit about this in a second. And on the other side, I work with the uh, on the other side, I work with the National Capital Project, and we're trying to bridge these these two. So, the National Capital Capital Project or NARCAP, in a nutshell, is a project where we try to integrate the intrinsic value of nature, in this case, in protecting the coast, into major decision decisions, management decisions, development decisions, and so on. And we do this through the development of uh, open source software, which is called Invest, which is used to map and value uh, the services provided by nature. So for example, and this is really aimed at the policy makers, not so much at the scientists. So it has to be simple and visual to convince them. So for example, we have your, your coast, and we plot where your existence are protecting you the most in such a way that you are convinced that then it's worth investing on these ecosystems in restoring them or in protecting them. Um, and we do this for coastal protection. This is also done for recreation, fisheries, renewable energy, carbon capture, and many other services provided by, by ecosystems. So as I mentioned, in, within this pretty large project, I'm uh, in charge of the coastal protection, coastal engineering area. And another challenge with this is that this is also thought to be used in countries where 
it's called developing world, where sometimes we do not have much expertise or we do not have much resources. Uh, so this has to work in places where there's very limited data and very poor expertise and resources too. So that's a major challenge in the development of this, this software. On the other hand, I'm also based at the there at Stanford at the Department of Geophysics, where I work for the group of simulation of geophysical multi-phase flows. And it's a wide group. We've looked at lava flows and tsunamis and so on, uh, everything that is multi-phase and geophysical. And then we worked at the development of uh, computational codes, original codes that are customized for the problem at hand. So more in particular, some of the stuff I do is, for example, this. This award we have the we're currently working with the Bahamas with the government, one of the, the Bahamas are many islands, and one of the, the largest island, it's very underdeveloped, and they want to develop it, but in a way that is sustainable. So they want this uh, to be a pilot project where they can play with this uh, green engineering, as, in, as it's been called, or hybrids between green and gray. For example, we have a beach profile there in the Bahamas. We have potentially the seawall and mangrove. And what they want to see is how can we combine this in a way that that, 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 is, uh, that yields the best or the minimum cost, still protecting the, the shore. So this is kind of plus they are interested in seeing. So something that at maximum water level reached at the seawall for a, for a given storm as a function of the restored mangrove buffer. So this is something that the policymakers can analyze, right? So they look, if I have mono mangrove for a given storm, I would have 1.6 meters of, of water at my, at my coast. Hence, I need a seawall that is at least 1.6 meters of, or taller. Then if I restore 800 meters of mangrove, that is reduced by 50%. But restoring 800 meters of mangrove might be very expensive, so how about I only restore 100 meters, then that still reduces by 25%. So they can start playing with that and to come up with their decision. And that's what it's, the type of outcomes that we expect from this open source that I, software that I was speaking of. But of course, a course like this has to be informed by physics-based models. So for that, I'm currently working on this model developed by the Tars called XPish. Some of you may know it. It's, uh, it, uh, it's used to, to assess the impact of a, of a storm in a beach by solving well, different equations that can give you more details if you want. And then trying to simplify it and adapt it and incorporate it into this, this uh, tool that we have, which is another, I think this is another very important tool of our time, which is open source collaboration. We can use, we can benefit from open software in order to integrate it into our open software platform so someone else can build on that. And um, there's also a bit of a field, com field component to this. And it, I think this picture illustrates what I was talking about. We're, there's very little resources uh, allocated to do actual research on this. So for example, we had to build this uh, very primitive tool to measure the pitch profile. But it was worth it because now, thanks to the simulations and that code that we produced, they are convinced that it's worth exploring this further, so they were speaking about getting more money for us to do an actual uh, research at the site and get uh, proper tools and differential GPS, for example, and to measure bathymetries and so on. But then we have this uh, couple of produce there, and, uh, but do I really trust the values there? I necessarily don't. There, there's so many assumptions behind that, so there's more work that has to be done in the fundamental side. So for example, something I'm doing in the short term is uh, for those of you with a bit of background fluid mechanics, where we have the conservation of momentum. Uh, the presence of vegetation is always part of course, yeah, it's really all of course part of the trust as a, as a body force, which is a drag force, which extracts momentum so from the mean flow. Uh, because it's a drag force through what we have type yarn can take this form. So in theory, if you are able to quantify or calibrate all these values that you find in that expression, you should be able to parameterize well the presence of your vegetation. But I say in theory, because even when you have highly controlled experiments, if you want to, some of the largest uncertainty there is in the drug coefficient, the CD that you find there. And even when you have highly controlled experiments, this is what a good field looks like. So this is the drug versus the Reynolds number. And the points that you see there are the measured uh, or estimated drug coefficients. So that is a hard fit. And apparently this is a good fit, so you can see the, the degree of uncertainty there, which makes us wonder, well, perhaps there's something else we can do, and I'll speak about this in a second. But something I'm doing in the short term is try to, so the people we work with can't really measure all of these C, D, A, N, the relative view. So there might be different parameterizations that are simpler than that, and are customized, so that only depend on something that is easier to measure. 
the height of the vegetation, for example. And I'm also very interested in the quantifying the uncertainty as we simplify our expressions, because there's so much we can do really well. You can simplify, that's fine, as long as you know the uncertainty or the magnitude of your uncertainty. So that's what I'm trying to do, and for that I'm developing the, my, my own codes with the, 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 the shallow water equations, uh, where I can plug in different uh, parameterizations that I'm trying to explore and then uh, compare against field measurements, HSP Bay in Virginia, for what I said for measurement is the, the degree of uncertainty, how it increases as we simplify further, if it, if it increases at all. So, right, so I was speaking about the what could we do differently from this? Uh, are we starting with the right mathematical framework? So just to give you a context of uh, the evolution of uh, open channel flow for those of you with some background on this, we've been studying open channel flow for quite a while and can be traced back to as many other things to Da Vinci and in the, the study of the streams. It really started, or started to take the form of the hydraulics as we, as we teach in civil engineering in the 1700s with the French engineers, which you see among them. And it really took a formal form, a mathematical form, with the Navier Stokes equations in the 1800s. So, all these 300 years was all water, water flowing. Uh, ideally, just like the, the idea of how water flowing in a graphic geometry often. So, but we started to realize in the 1930s that actually it's very important to quantify the sediment that is transported by the rivers, for example. So, a pioneer work there was made by Shields in the 1930s, where he systematically run experiments for different particle diameters of the bed and different flow velocities and found a curve that is still widely used today, which is called the Shields curve, to estimate when a particle at the bed is going to start moving. And then uh, something curious about a curious anecdote about Shields is that he was American. He did his PhD in Berlin in the 1930s. So when he went back to America after his PhD, even though he did this break, well, this really relevant research, he wasn't able to find any job because in his thesis he had this stamped there, so <laughs> I actually took that from the original thesis, so it's, uh, I have to check that fact. <laughs> um, so, well, nonetheless, we, this, this Nazi-financed research is still widely used today, and it took until the 2008 with an interesting experiment that showed that actually, all this time, we knew that it was uncertainty related to that, because we assume that the particle depends on the magnitude of the force, well, the initiation of the motion of the particle depends on the magnitude of the force, but it was proved by this uh, very creative experiment that actually depends more on the impulse, so the time that force has been applied to that particle. So you can see roughly the evolution of this until it was really in the last 10, 15 years that people start to realize actually we need to, we cannot really idealize this as just water flowing in a fixed geometry, so we have to take into account the presence of vegetation, the sediment transport, and so on. And for the, this paper, for example, uh, Professor Nicola proposes the creation of a discipline just called the hydrodynamics of aquatic vegetation. Some people have proposed eco hydrodynamics, eco geomorphology, eco geomorphodynamics. So the point being that a new discipline is needed that is highly multidisciplinary in that sense. So as I mentioned, I think some of the problem is that we still understand open channel flows or we, the way we are taught in our books in civil engineering is that it's a flow of water of an ideal geometry of fixed, uh, uh, fixed geometry, sorry, of uh, uniform roughness, whereas in reality, natural open channels tend to be more like this, right? So it's complex geometry, interaction with an erodible bed, sediment transport, interaction with, uh, with vegetation. And so everything that deviates from the theory that we have developed for this, we try to add it to this framework rather intuitively. So one thing we could do, and this is a, one of the ideas I would like to explore next, is try to come up, uh, try to study a different framework. And for this, for us to be with more interest in the thing in how it is, there's the idea of the double average Navier Stokes equations, which kind of relate, it's a bit of an ex uh, if you have heard the runs, the Reynolds average Navier Stokes equation, which decompose the variables in a in the average in a fluctuation in space, here is also considered in time. So that in a way that we can consider all the roughness that is inherent in basically all all natural open channels. And some terms there are, are very familiar, we know them pretty well. And some others are very conventional yet, but uh, rather meaningful from a physical perspective. So these two, for example, are Relate to drag, pressure drag, viscous drag. So they relate to the presence of an element in our flow, like the vegetation. 
So, and this is what, what I meant. So sometimes we this is what we just dump into this type of ex expression, rather from an intuitive, uh, rather from intuition instead of a mathematical rigor. But it's not only mathematical rigor. I care a lot when I do this expression. It's also because if you if you start from the very general case and then you simplify from there, then you have more control over what you simplify, what you leave outside, and you can also have an idea of the magnitude of your uncertainty when you have, when you want to use a simple expression. You might not be able to apply this equation. You might be able. You might have to do something like what we are doing. If you want to connect with the applied end, but at least you know what is uncertainty there. And this might not sound too important, but in the project, in the context of the project where I work, where at the end you connect these, say, geophysical variables, water levels, erosion of the bed, sorry, of the beach, when you connect that to metrics like number of lives at risk, then the uncertainty is important. It's important to know if it's 100 plus minus 1 lives or 100 plus minus 100 lives. Um, so, well, how can we do that? I'm not completely sure right now, but it's important to investigate these unconventional terms, and for that we need carefully designed experiments, coupled with high performance computing, that's what I'm currently trying to do, but unfortunately I do not have results yet to, do, to show this, I'm still trying to convince people that it's worth doing this. Another idea, and after this I will connect with some of the work I've done in sediment transport, for those of you interested in bit on SCAO, for example. But we can also gain, I think, a lot from new analytical approaches. So we tend to look at the same problem from the same perspective. We add things to that, so sometimes it's worth rethinking the problem. An example here is, for example, um, equilibrium beach profiles. So beach profiles tend to, uh, well, this is disputed, but tend to an equilibrium, for example, for summer and then for winter. Uh, and this has historically been, or has been seen as a problem of fitting a curve to field measurements. And then it's just perfection of that, so let's try to to improve this parameter or so on. And then uh, I like this paper from 2006 because they show that actually if we treat this as a thermodynamic system, it should not violate like second law thermodynamics. And they prove that uh, you can actually find analytical solutions that fit these pitch profiles very well. And well in environmental field mechanics, thermodynamics tends to be underused. Perhaps uh, it's related to the fact that environmental field mechanics tend to be dominated by civil engineers who might not necessarily have a strong background or interest in thermodynamics. So, but I think this could also be used for something to study to reanalyze uh, the generation of bed forms, which is something that is still not completely understood. So to give an example of this, I would like to refer to the work I did during my, during my PhD. Uh, so as Paul mentioned, I, did, uh, I finished my PhD at the University of Edinburgh, Professor Alistair Borwick, I don't, I'm not sure if some of you may know him. And then I was very interested, uh, as I mentioned, in morphodynamics, and uh, hopefully some of you will have similar interest in the context of the scour of uh, offshore structures or bridges, the base of bridges. The two questions really I wanted to answer is, uh, can we reduce the empiricism in the conventional morphodynamic models? And I'll speak a little bit about this in a second. And then can we improve the conventional models? So, so to give you a uh, very short introduction to this, the conventional way in which we approach the problem, it's when we have, say, a bathymetry, so the topography of the seabed, and we run some model that gives you hydrodynamics, so whether you're looking at waves or tides or so on, you end up with something like that, like it's a velocity field. And to this velocity field, you couple or you invoke a sediment transport uh, module. It tells you for this velocity field, you will have these sediment transport rates. And the sediment transport rates, of course, will cause a change in your bathymetry, and so you continue your loop. And uh, basically, all the big models that you will find out there, the software like the F3D, my 21 Telemac, XPH, they all follow this general uh, pattern. But I was particularly interested in that model there, the sediment transport, because almost invariably, this is an empirical formula, and there are dozens of these. Basically, everyone with a plume comes up with his or her own empirical expression. And the interesting thing is they all yield very different results, so there's a huge uncertainty there uh, related to that empiricism. So I wanted to see if we could do something different with that. So referring to this idea of trying new analytical approaches, uh, I thought we could probably think about this a form of a flow divided in two layers, where we have transfers of mass and momentum between, between all layers, uh, the third layer being the bed, which is fixed, uh, with some assumptions 
for the lower layer of the bee fixed in time and space that would have vanished the thickness just to represent the, the bed load transport which is the transport related to, to core sediment and the upper layer related to suspension which is related to fine sediment um, other than that I will solve for, for the rest, the velocities and the, and the densities in both and if I wanted to be, uh, to to be independent of, a, of an empirical formula for sediment transport rates then that's something that should be different, should be done differently related to the erosion of the bed which is the source of, well not always but in many cases the source of sediment transport. So for that I, was, I based uh, my work, my previous work, uh, by the, the, the excellent uh, paper by Carola Capard and the idea roughly goes like this, if you think of your bed as an interface that feels two different shear stresses at the upper and lower part of this interface and then you think of the upper one as being the one caused by the flow hence you can use a GC type expression uh, which is dependent on the quadratic velocity and you think of the lower one as a bed resistance that comes from the idea of failure plate in swim mechanics then the difference between the two should be related to a transfer of mass in or worse an erosion so if the upper one is larger than the lower one it has to be compensated by erosion so then, when there is erosion, because of conservation of mass, all that sediment that has been lifted then has to be transported. So then we have sediment transport. And our consequence is, of course, the mean level of the bed lowers. And this, this, also, this mass transported there is modeled as an increase in the average density of that particular layer. So in other words, then you can solve sediment transport, hydrodynamics, and morphological evolution, all coupled in the same model without require an empirical formula for sediment transport rates you still require some empirical expressions to parameterize your shear stresses obviously so well just to show that it works I, it was valid, I, I validated against a common empirical expression for, for bed load transport have our shear stress or measure bed load transport rates the discontinued lines are empirical expressions and you can see there it's the same they have been derived for highly controlled experiments and there's almost a, an order of magnitude difference between them which I'm speaking of the width of the band delimited by these curves uh, and the solid lines are the model for different values of the calibration parameter CB which is another uh, advantage I would say that it only requires one calibration parameter as opposed to the conventional models where you require similar parameter for the hydrodynamics plus the selection of the formula from a large catalog and depending on what formula then you may need additional parameters so, as you can see, it, it follows the, the general trend, which then I was able to prove mathematically that it follows the expression, which is an expression to which many of the empirical formulae arrive through empirical means, obviously, through feeding curves. And in general, there was agreement with, 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 with bed load transport theory. So, that answered the first question, which was uh, can we do, do something differently? So, yes, now can we improve, not just to increase the uh, the availability of options, but then can we improve the ones that, are, that tend to be used most of the times? So, if I run a typical benchmark case, which is the migration of a sandbar, so think of a sandbar which is submerged and is subject to a current to start migrating. We know this problem very well from a qualitative perspective. So, the sandbar has to migrate down the stream, and the, steep, uh, the downstream phase of the, of the sandbar has to steepen with time. And also we know that this cannot steep to the infinite because it's steep into the infinite because of gravity. So when it's really steep due to gravity, the, the sediment particles will try to move uh, in the downslope direction. Which, if you think about this as an affection diffusion problem, that translates into diffusion, right? So when I run the model, it, it agrees with all this that I just said very well. So we have the migration, the steepening of the of the downstream phase, and also some diffusion. As opposed to when we run the conventional model, which we are, this is a well-known problem, but yes, it has the, the migration, the steepening, but it creates this unrealistic oscillation there. Often these oscillations are treated from a, a numerical perspective, so they add some numerical diffusion to this, to which I was against too, because the diffusion is real, it's physical based diffusion, so you should not combine numerics with physics there. So I argued that the model had the advantage of inherently included this diffusion that prevented the formation of these unrealistic oscillations but then I need to prove that it was a, that it was the right diffusion so we know it has a high diffusion though but is it is it not too much efficient 
So, well, then I validated, I get some experiments in tilting dudes that yielded good results, which led me to the second question that I told you at the beginning. So, can we use this model to, can we use the upper model to improve the, the, the lower model? So for that, one thing I did was a conventional way of treating this problem, as I mentioned, is when you have your uh, <coughs> setting a track for QB. You often have a second term, which is uh, what you see there, that is proportional to the to the slope, meaning that when the slope is tangent or beta, when it's zero, of course, that term vanishes. It's also proportional to the sediment transfer itself, as you would expect, and then multiplied by this deficit coefficient epsilon, which, in the conventional way, is another calibration parameter. So they just play with that, trying to to fit their measurement where you have measurements, so another calibration, adding empiricism to the to the, to the approach. But then I realized that actually if you divide that and you define this capital pi by dividing it to everything by QBH, that, that, that's a question of a line, which is important because from my model I was able to find an analytical expression for this capital pi as a function of the tangent of the slope. And it's nonlinear, it's the red nonlinear line that you see there. It's, strictly speaking, it's nonlinear, but actually for a wide range of value, it follows a very linear behavior, as you can see by the overlapping of the of the red lines there, sorry, the black lines to the red lines. In other words, the slope of these black lines is the epsilon there. So you could use the model to come up with an analytical expression for epsilon that does not require any other calibration parameters. We're trying to tackle the problem of reducing empiricism. And this is the expression that I was able to derive, which at the very least has a, is physically meaningful. So tau here represents the shear stress. So as you can see for a large shear stress, shear, uh, large velocities, this term, the whole term vanishes, which is what you observe in experiments. In other words, it doesn't matter if you have a horizontal slope or a very steep slope. If the, if the flow is really fast, it's all governed by the hydrodynamics, which you represented there. So then just to test this idea, I compare against, uh, it was difficult to compare against other expressions for epsilon because what I said, it tends to be a calibration parameter, so people use different values, often constant. <coughs> uh, there's one work that doesn't propose uh, a value for that, but from his work I could deduce what they would have proposed if they wanted, <laughs> which was not a different from that one, but it was. Uh, so that's from the work by Baylor. And so again, we have the same problem, the sandbar, which is exactly something like this. The black line is with no modification, so, so the epsilon growth is zero. So again, it has a creation of these unrealistic oscillations, which eventually renders the model unstable. Then if I plug in the expression by Baylor that I did use from Baylor's work, we end up with the blue line. So yes, it avoids the creation of these oscillations, but it's over diffuse. It does have the, the steepening of the downstream phase that I spoke about. If then we plug in the red, uh, sorry, the, the one that I proposed, we end up with the red line, which at least from a quality perspective, it has a, what we expect, the migration or the steepening of that and the prevention of these oscillations. So there is potential. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to, to compare against experiments because that's another problem. We are lacking basic experiments that you could use for, for calibration purposes. Um, and if you are into, into curiosities, this expression also the, takes this form, which the tangent of this phi, phi is the angle of repose. For, you know, for those of you who back in the twin mechanics, you know, this tends to be a constant around 30 degrees per cent. So numerically, this is very, very similar to one of the von Karman constant, which might be just a coincidence, but uh, it's interesting nonetheless. <laughs> so summarizing what I said in the last slides, it is more approaching the old problem with, with new analytical tools, because that can also, because that can help us uh, generate new insights into the problem. In this particular case, uh, the model that I proposed it did not require an empirical expression for, for closure, for sediment transfer rates, uh, and it further can be used to derive a slope related diffusivity that can be plugged into a conventional model and yield better results to go from this to something like this without further empiricism. So it is worth exploring. So in connection to renewable energy, what can we do now? That was chapter two, so now to conclude, I know everyone here has interest in renewable energy. 
So some of the work we also do with the natural capital project, as I mentioned, some of it is coastal protection, some of it is uh, recreation, some of it is carbon capture. We also done some work in wave energy, and it's the same, the same idea. We produce um, quick assessment tools that are really aimed at the policy makers to tell them where you have more potential to, to install your wave farms. But uh, that in itself is not so difficult, right? A lot of people have done similar things. But what is interesting about this is because it's a quick assessment tool, and basically anyone can run this, you can combine it with other things. So it turns out that in some places, for example, uh, it is in the in British Columbia, you may have conflicts. So you may have a lot of potential where you, where you also have uh, fisheries. So then if you develop wind farms where people benefit from fishing, you lose and you win. So you can also play with that in, in, uh, in this tool. So you can go there and see where that you have the least conflict. So something else we can do with that is, in, in my view, is to connect also this, this concept of wave energy to coastal protection. After all, a wave energy farm, it's a, uh, extract, extracts uh, energy from the, from the sea, reduces the wave heights, so this can be also beneficial. So you could use this uh, if you want a, a project of beach recovery, for example, or if you want to create a low energy climate that sometimes is required to restore these ecosystems like marshes or mangroves in tropical areas. But again, for this, the same applies. We need to create these tools that are aimed at the people who have the funding and the money. So they finance the fundamental research that we need in order to make sure that we implement this in a correct way. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's all I had. So thank you very much for your attention and well, any questions are very welcome. When you look at this, uh, the, the cost of uh, erosion, um, what is the demand, the cost, main cost for, for cost of erosion? Like you say, is it washed in sand or wave? So is there a wave or is the, the, the tide or anything else? Uh, it can be several things, but in general it's the action of the waves. You can have short term erosion when you have a storm, which basically you have a large a lot of energy being dissipated only. So it's a combination of both, because often the waves are the ones that break the beach, but then you need the currents, the undertow currents that take that sand away. And sometimes it's not a permanent erosion. So for example, what happens in many beaches around the, in the Northern Hemisphere, during the winter you have high energy waves, which take the sand away, but not beyond a point from which it can be recovered. What it means is that then in summer, when you have low energy waves, they bring that sand back to the beach and, and the beach recovers. So it's hard to say when it's going to be permanent in erosion or not, but often it's, uh, so it's related to high energy, so what you would expect from a storm, for example. And of course, then sea level rises plays a role when, uh, sorry, sea level rise plays a role. When it rises, then, then eventually you're going to lose that beach even uh, permanently. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, the, it's just the way. Um, so, it's the the energy or the velocity of the particle of the warm, uh, of the of the water to wash all this. Uh, also, you mean at the fundamental level, what happens? Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean as similar to what usually happens is a uh, it's continue a wave is continually eroding a beach every time it breaks it uh, yeah. leaves sediment it's their sediment to suspension. But there's a dynamic equilibrium normally. But when you have higher energy, then we'll erode. Then we'll tend to erode more. And also, waves are associated with currents that are caused by the waves themselves. So these currents take that sediment away, and that's what uh, has the net effect of eroding the beach or doing a causing a shoreline retreat. Okay, another last question. Is the way you, you mentioned that you implement all this uh, treatment of water together for, for watering of this um, sediment uh, transportation? So, like the hydrodynamics and uh, sediment uh, transportation, all this treatment of water together? Yeah, for yep. the watering. And then, which part is the most difficult one or most uncertain? Uh, is that hydrodynamics, like the dynamic stock equation? You, you saw, the equation is correct, but solving the equation is very difficult. Yeah. Okay. 
and then you have like the sediment uh, transportation uh, border. And uh, which one, like I say, which part is most uh, uh, difficult on? I mean, uh, give the most uh, the challenges. The error I mean, is uh, moderate. Yeah, so in the, for example, the, co the model that I was proposing, of course I spoke about the nice things and what went well, but there are also many problems. So sometimes it's not really the problem with the model itself, but the application of the model. So for example, this model is based on the idea of depth average uh, layers, which means that you're neglecting the, not, you're not neglecting the vertical velocities, but you're assuming that your horizontal velocities are much larger. So if you apply that to a place where your vertical velocities are very large, like when there are waves present, then there will be a lot of uncertainty from the hydrodynamic part. But in general, to, to give a quicker answer to that is sediment transport that where you have much more uncertainty as a product, where you have much more uncertainty. So in particular, when I spoke about these two shear stresses at the base, that seems to give good results, but still I I can't get away completely from empiricism. So I use an empirical expression to close those, to to parameterize those shear stresses. But this could be better. I, I haven't been able to still quantify the uncertainty associated to that, but I would think that there is where a large degree of uncertainty lies. Any other questions? Perhaps yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, Sergey. Thank you. <laughs>